Hi guys, it is a lovely but chilly winter day here in South Austin, Texas. We have made it to Monday, January 14th, 2013. So that means it is time for me to do my normal Monday morning roundup, the economic meltdown roundup, where I go right here on the pages of the mainstream media here at Yahoo News to bring you a roundup of articles uh, from the mainstream media about the various ways the uh, U.S. economy is going to hell in a handbasket. And uh, I woke up this morning and I'm feeling like shit, guys. Uh, I hope I'm not getting this flu that everyone else in the country is getting since I was not a good little slave. I did not and will not be, ever get a flu shot. So I'm dealing with it now. Never got sick in the whole year 2012, and here I am, already sick. So why was I not surprised? I'm sitting here and thinking, oh God, how am I going to get down there and do my, do my job as a doomsday prophet today? Uh, and I find this article right here, right here today, CNBC, major flu outbreak could slow U.S. economy Further, I like the way they uh, use that honest word, further. All right. One of the worst flu seasons in a decade is putting further strains on an already sluggish U.S. economy as companies get slammed with increased health care costs and lower productivity from widespread worker absences. And if I was a, quote, worker, uh, I would probably be calling in sick today. But uh, I'm here doing, doing my job, sick or not. Okay, on average, seasonal flu outbreaks cost U.S. employees $10.4 billion dollars in direct cost of hospitalizations and outpatient visits, according to the CDC. And this doesn't even include indirect costs related to lost productivity and worker absenteeism. And this is in a, that's in a quote, normal flu year, which this one isn't anything but. <clears throat> but this year, that figure is expected to go much higher than $10.4 billion as the flu virus has shown up in some 41 states, including right here in Texas, with 29 of them reporting high or severe levels of sickness as thousands are flooding into hospital emergency rooms and doctor's offices. Okay, uh, quote, if this is a major influenza outbreak like the Spanish flu of 1918, it could have a very significant effect on economic growth, said some economists from Northwood University. If GDP is projected to be 2% this year, the flu, cut, the flu could cut that back to one half percent growth rate. Uh, now, that's, of course, if this were a, a pandemic like in, uh, in uh, 1918. But anyway, this is, uh, this shows all its maps and statistics and all of this stuff. So uh, I will put a link to this story like I do with every one of these stories. So you can go ahead and find out more about that. But... Uh, flu will come and go like it does every year and also like it does every year uh, the debt ceiling the debt ceiling uh, will will come uh, this year and it will go when in the 11th this this is my great uh, doomsday profit <coughs> prediction of how the the the, the debt ceiling du jour of 2013 is going to play out. There's going to be all of this panic, just like we saw in this fiscal cliff horseshit 
uh, all last fall, which uh, on, uh, you know, in the waning hours, I think of December 31st, uh, Congress and Obama made some compromise and kicked the can further down the road. This is exactly what is going to happen uh, over the next two to three months so with, the, with this debt ceiling uh, horseshit. There's going to be all of this uh, chest pounding and, uh, and growling back and forth and drawing lines in the sand between Obama and, and, the, and, and Congress. Uh, you know, all of this name calling and blaming each other, all of this shit. And then in the last hours, they're going to come together uh, and, and patch together some horse shit compromise to kick the can a little further down the road. And I, I think, well, I'll find on this article, I think they've kicked the can down the road 76 times, 76 times in the past few years, and this will be one more can kicker. At some point, guys, uh, you, you know, they're not going to be able to kick the can any further. They're, they're, you know, I don't envy these guys. This is no joke. Uh, if, if, if they don't kick the can a little further down the road, there's going to be hell to pay this year. But if they continue to kick the can down the road, when they do get to the end of this dead end road of can kicking, uh, and there's nowhere left to kick the can, we are going to see a, 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 an economic collapse uh, of, of major proportions. Uh, so it, it, you know, it's, it, it all depends on how soon and how big you want your collapse. The sooner, the smaller. It'll still be, it'll still be pretty bad, but the later we wait to deal with this, uh, and, and the Democrats, these liberals, of which I am one generally are going to have to listen to these to these damn Republicans. It was much as it, it, I hate to admit this, uh, they're a little more uh, clued in to uh, what's going to happen the farther we kick it down the road. But they're all going to get together and do it. So here we are, the uh, the number one story on the business page today, right here this morning. There's Obama. You know, pounding his, pounding his chest. Obama says refusal to lift debt ceiling would hurt economy. All right, President Barack Obama warned Congress on Monday, meaning today, that a refusal to raise the U.S. debt ceiling next month would trigger economic chaos. He said a Republican refusal to lift the debt ceiling could lead the United States into a debt default which would prevent the U.S. government from being able to provide Social Security benefits to some seniors and possibly tip the economy back into recession. Quote, it would be a self inflicted wound on the uh, economy, Obama said. Blah, 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 and here you go. It's just, you know, it's just, it's just this whole fiscal cliff uh, bullshit debate uh, all over again, and we all know how it's going to pan out because particularly as politicians, they have no choice but to raise the, which is exactly what is going to happen. It's not going to happen to the last, to the last few hours. But if you want to join this uh, debate and find out a little bit uh, more about it, and, and guys, you better believe that all of this, this uh, new debt ceiling debate, uh, which is stepped right into the fiscal cliff debate, is going to be the major U.S. economic story uh, for the foreseeable future. 
uh, including right here in these rants. I'm already bored with it myself because we all know how it's going to turn out. But uh, if you want to educate yourself, I highly su suggest you click on the link to this story from... Uh, I don't even know who this is from. CNN Money. This is from our friends at CNN, their money pages. Debt ceiling FAQs, frequently asked questions. Debt ceiling frequently asked questions. What you need to know. And this is a long involved uh, story which, which breaks it down. And they do a pretty good job of not get, of not do, Know, falling to the left or to the right on this and trying to stay, quote, journalistically objective. Yeah, right, those words, journalistically objective. And, and just laying it out what it is that they're negotiating. And uh, I, I'm going to start this off and refer you, if you want to go further into this, this is a, a you, you should read this. Okay. Uh, I'll just read the first few paragraphs here. Congress narrowly avoided pushing the country off the fiscal cliff, yeah, but it has done nothing to address the next and potentially bigger risk to the economy than the fiscal cliff, which is the need to raise the debt ceiling. To help separate fact from fiction in the battle, here is what you need to know about the issue. Okay, and the first question is, what is the debt ceiling exactly? Answer, the debt ceiling is a cap set by Congress on the amount of money the federal government may borrow. I, I'm not 100% sure to this day who exactly they're borrowing it from. Uh, is, is it China or is it the big banksters? Uh, it doesn't answer that question. Uh, nowhere in this list of questions does it answer the question exactly who is the federal government borrowing it from. But anyway, uh, the debt limit applies to debt owed to the public i.e. anyone who buys U.S. bonds and uh, read China. I, I don't know if China is going to keep falling for this shit. Uh, plus debt that the Treasury owes to government trust funds such as Social Security and Medicare. And this is the most direct way that, that you could be threatened if you're relying on Social Security and Medicare. Okay, why does the debt ceiling need to be raised? Okay, the debt ceiling needs to be raised periodically because both parties in Congress have already approved tax cuts and in spending increases over the years past, knowing full well that they would add to deficits. By doing so, they increase the country's future borrowing needs, and this is how this snowball has gotten completely out of control. Uh, this is why raising the debt ceiling is not a, quote, license to spend more, as some Republicans assert. It simply lets the Treasury Department continue to pay all the country's obligations that Congress has already approved, whether that's a payment to a federal contractor, a Social Security check, to a senior blah blah blah. So here's the question I asked earlier. Since March 1962, Congress has raised the debt limit 76 times, 11 of those in the past decade, and so we are now standing at a at a debt ceiling of 16.4 trillion dollars. 
trillion dollars. We actually hit that on uh, on December 31st of 2012, as I mentioned and, and on, on my rant on New Year's Eve that day. But they've cobbled together. The, the U.S. government is limping along on... Uh, it's, we're just literally limping along on all of these horseshit ways to pay our, you know, to pay our bills uh, for the next couple of months until, uh, it, it, you know, they, we're looking at April 1st, April Fool's Day is, is the, is D-Day, uh, and, and probably sooner than that, uh, we're, we're going to hit the ceiling. But anyway, guys, this is, uh, if you want to educate yourself and follow this story so you can understand what this dumb hippie on a rock you should go and uh, and read this. <clears throat> I just couldn't uh, help this. I won't spend much time here uh, on the story out of Reuters news. You you might have heard one of the one of the things that they were tossing around was, was printing a trillion dollar platinum coin. Uh, you understand that the U.S. Treasury Department does not print uh, dollar bills, paper money, this monopoly money is not printed by the U.S. government. It is printed by the Federal Reserve. So one of these brilliant ideas being tossed around, well, since, since our own government can't print paper money, why don't we just, and, 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 and we can't for all intents and purposes, print gold or silver. We've kind of written ourselves out of that. Uh, but we can, the U.S. government can still print platinum coins. So one idea is, okay, since this is our last gasp uh, option we have left ourselves to print our own money, uh, why don't we just print like a trillion dollars worth of platinum coins and pump up the economy that way? Well, guys, apparently that idea has been shot down uh, as one... Uh, as one analyst was calling it, it sounds like something out of a Simpsons that you know that Bart Simpson would have come up with. Yeah, let's uh, let, let's take care of our problems by printing more money, platinum coins. Uh, this is out of Reuters. Uh, Treasury and the Fed kill idea of one trillion dollar platinum coins to avert debt crisis. Okay, so much for the one trillion dollar platinum coin idea. The U.S. Treasury Department said on Saturday it will not produce platinum coins as a way of generating one trillion dollars in revenue and avoiding a battle in Congress over raising the U.S. debt ceiling. Uh, the idea of creating uh, $1 trillion by minting platinum coins had gained some currency among Democrats in recent days as a way of sidestepping congressional Republicans who were threatening to reject a necessary increase in the debt ceiling unless deep spending cuts are made. Uh, the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve I love this next clause, both independent of one another. Each concluded this was not a viable option. Guys, the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve are about as independent of each other as, uh, you know, as, as a horse's mouth and a horse's ass. Uh, <laughs> They all eat the they, they eat the same thing and they ship the same thing from one end to the next, guys. Uh, for anyone suffering some delusion of some independence, here's the independence. But anyway, I'll put a link to that story. Okay, enough of this. Uh, enough of this debt ceiling shit. Uh, we'll all be sick of it soon enough. Let's look at just a few more. I'm, I'm going to make this rant. I hope fairly quick here's a story to switch gears retail roundup this is from uh, the exchange uh, retail roundup sluggish sales 
trends, sluggish sales trends for the big chains. So this is a, a roundup of the big retailers. What they're looking like this week. Uh, chains, chain stores reporting holiday sales this week have been largely unimpressive with GameStop, Toys R Us, and Tiffany all posting lackluster sales, or lackluster results. Uh, and this, this one I love, and this is why I flagged the story, Best Buy said its revenue and same store sales fell, but since even worse numbers had been feared on Wall Street, the stock and Best Buy soared in response. Uh, you know this 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 is uh, this is unbelievable. Uh, the electronic seller said Friday that revenue was down 0.4 percent uh, to 12.8 billion dollars, and and same store sales fell 1.4 percent in the nine week period ending in January 5th. However, owing to the fact that analyst said it would be even weaker, Best Buy stock went up 16%. <laughs> you know, guys, uh, it's, it's completely crazy uh, because the news was not as bad as some of the, the doomsday or uh, these doomsday profits had predicted. Uh, because the, the doom and gloom wasn't as deep as some doom and gloomers thought it might be, that that is quote good news. That is what good news. Uh, to see, if you want to send the stock in your company soaring, just have your sales in your stores fall 1.4 percent, and your stock will rise 16 percent. Okay. <laughs> Beyond this, quote, but it could have been so ugly, thesis driving Best Buy sharply higher. The bigger economic story here is that none of these well-known and found everywhere retailers had sales in the last two months of the year that suggest consumers were overly anxious to spend their money. There you go, uh, but you can click on this link to find out uh, more uh, what's going on there. And uh, let's see, uh, let's look in here uh, at, at, let's take one more goodbye story to the fiscal cliff. One thing that did come out of that compromise, uh, that, that joke kicked the can down, down the road compromise a couple weeks ago, is that payroll tax uh, takes a new bite from the, uh, from the Wall Street Journal uh, about how the, the payroll tax, which did go back up, how big of a bite is that taking out of your paycheck? Since, since I have no paycheck, it's taking no bite out of mine, but how is this affecting other Americans? Okay. American workers are opening their first paychecks of the year and finding an unpleasant surprise. The government's take has gone up. Gee, what a surprise. Uh, a temporary cut, what people have already forgotten, is, is, is that this is just going back to the size bite it was a couple of years ago before this temporary cut from a few years back which came to an end. A temporary cut in Social Security withholdings gave Americans hundreds of extra dollars to spend over the past two years, but Congress allowed that break to expire during the wrangling over the fiscal cliff meaning that Social Security taxes have reverted to 6.2% of American salary from the temporary 4.2%. Uh, the noticeable lightening of paychecks 
as consumers remain tentative threatens to put a drag on economic growth. The effect for companies is that their hit is likely to cement a frugal attitude that led consumers to cut back on such things as eating out and shifting to less expensive uh, store brands. And uh, Robert Williams, a tax economist at one of these, one of these places that economists hang out said the expiration of the payroll tax cut will leave the average American household with 18 to 20 dollars less to spend each week or 900 to a thousand dollars a year uh, for the country's consumers as a whole that is a decline of 120 billion dollars from last year which comes out to about 0.8% 0 .0 of U.S. gross domestic product. Okay, and then they go, uh, you know, interviewing. I, I love this, who they, who they chose to interview here. Uh, so then they start heading to the man and woman on the street and saying, okay, how is this going to affect your consumer spending? And I just have to put one of my... Uh, uh, one of my rants on here. So they chose, just as an example of an average American, Carrie Baker, an accountant in Salt Lake City, recently received her first 2013 paycheck and realized that she and her husband will take home $250 less every month. So that's about $3,000. The 32-year-old Miss Ms. Barker, who works as a financial controller for a medical devices company, took a second job last week doing accounting work uh, for a friend's startup company. And, uh, and, 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 I, and I love this. Ms. Barker recently had a second child who joined her first child in daycare. So now she has uh, the woman, you know, now she's working two jobs, so she has less and less time to spend with the one kid she had. So, what is it? so now she's brought another one. So now she has even less time, because now she's got to support this second little brat. She's got less time than ever to spend with her child, and she doubled her daycare cost. Oh boy, Ms. Barker has been planning meals more carefully to spend less on groceries and has switched to less expensive brands of household and baby items. Quote, I used to be a diapers snob. I love that, a diapers snob. And would only buy Pampers or Huggies. Now I buy Target's house brand because it's two-thirds the cost. <sighs> Bad news for Procter & Gamble, good news for Target. I have a way that, uh, that, that this woman and her husband could have, could have uh, completely eliminated eliminated down to zero their diaper budget and their daycare budget not to mention uh, everything else budget associated with these little brats if they had never had any children and my I'm 53 years old I got a vasectomy at age 22 before I let any of these little planet eating uh, little bundles of joy out of the bag my lifetime diaper budget from the day I was born is zero 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 is ham on little tails lifetime diaper budget ham on little tails daycare budget lifetime daycare budget zero 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 uh, but anyway uh, no, that, that's a whole nother rant uh, about why these breeders keep 
throwing themselves in prison and this and, 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 and sending their kids and this planet into a burning lake of fire. Let me shut up anyway. If you want to find out more about this, uh, go on this link and I will wrap up this rant. Instead of looking back, let's uh, look forward to next uh, next year. And what I did last week, and uh, I, uh, I I just didn't get around to this last week. So let me take one more look forward. Last week, I I, I looked at six of these economists looking forward into 2013 to see what they uh, what they see. This is uh, a from uh, this, from the Daily Ticker. This is an economist named David Levy, and his assessment is U.S. economy stuck in second gear. Okay, uh, according to David Levy, the U.S. economy may have managed to avoid going over the fiscal cliff, but fiscal debates still loom ahead and risks to the U.S. economy are skewed to the downside in 2013. Forecast David Levy, the chairman of the Jerome Levy Forecasting Center. Okay, Levy recently published his outlook for the new year in which he argues the U.S. economy is, quote, stuck in second gear, unable to accelerate, but not plunging off a cliff. All right, that's that. That's it. Uh, uh, according to Levy's outlook, we can expect more of the same economic trends we saw in 2012. Uh, what he is calling slow, even, slow, uneven growth, steady core inflation, and uh, employment gains that can that do continue, but not fast enough to really heal the labor market. Quote, we're in what we've referred to over the, over the last several years as a contained depression. A contained depression. And, well, some people uh, are, are not so sure how uh, contained this depression is. In this environment, Levy expects a flat trend and corporate earnings, he expects treasury yields, which saw record lows in 2012, to ultimately go even lower. Uh, looking at international headwinds, I'm limiting this rant right here to the country, to this country. Levy says it's hard to forecast their exact uh, directions. Uh, Levy sees emerging markets generally uneven but getting worse and Europe dealing with the realization that their deficits are have been getting even larger. What European policy makers do, he says, is yet another question. Uh, so anyway, guys, as I said at the beginning of this rant, I, uh, I feel like shit, my hands are freezing, and so before I succumb to the flu, I'm going to succumb to the end of this rant, this week's edition of uh, the January 14, 2013 edition of the Economic Meltdown Roundup, and I'll be back at, at you next week. With more of the same, but for now, I'm going to say bye, guys.